Love Talk Radio. Welcome to Awake to Oneness Radio. I am Caroline Chang, your host. The mission of Awake to Oneness Radio is to inspire the world to awaken to the universal truth of oneness. Science and spirituality are both telling us that we are all connected, that we are all one. So literally what you do to another person you're doing to another aspect of yourself. And I believe once the world, once mankind awakens to the universal truth of oneness, there will be peace on earth. Today's topic is One Mind with Dr. Larry Dosey, MD. I recently discovered um, Dr. Larry online. Actually, I first uh, heard of Dr. Larry's work um, mentioned by... um, Steve Farrell, who is Humanity's team, he was a, a previous guest on the show, but he is the worldwide director of Humanity's team, and he mentioned uh, he was reading a book, the book One Mind by Dr. Larry Dosey. So I had to do some research, and I discovered Dr. Larry on YouTube, and I'm so honored that he is here with us tonight to share his wisdom and knowledge with us. Um, welcome, Dr. Larry, to Awake to Oneness Radio. Thanks Thanks for the in- invitation, uh, Carolyn. It's just great to be with you. Thank you. I meant to mention to the audience that you are a medical doctor, um, and you were a chief of staff of a hospital at one time, um, and you are auth- uh, the author of over nine books, or nine books. So could you please share more um, with the audience um, how you um, went from traditional Western medicine to um, where you are today, where you incorporate mind and spirit into medicine and health care? I'd be happy to. Basically, uh, I've uh, practiced uh, medicine, internal medicine, for about three decades uh, first in Dallas, Texas, and then uh, a few years ago, my wife and I retired to uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. But my interest, uh, even from the earliest days of my practice as an internal medicine doctor, focused not just on the technical aspects of medical care, uh, but the uh, spiritual and psychological components of uh, health and illness. One of the reasons I was directed in that uh, that area was because of a personal a challenge to my health. Uh, from middle school onward, I uh, I had to deal with a, a really a, an illness which almost derailed my career before it even got started. This was known as classical migraine syndrome, which, uh, as everyone knows, is a form of headache. Uh, but in addition to the headache, there was profound incapacitating nausea and vomiting. But the worst uh, thing of all was partial blindness. I just simply could not see during these attacks. And so this got so much uh, worse during the stress of uh, university days and then uh, medical school uh, and a tour in Vietnam. And uh, after I came back with my internal medicine practice, it still got worse. So that by the time uh, I entered medical practice, I was desperate for a solution because nothing traditional worked. About that time in the late 60s and early 70s, a technique uh, of deep relaxation emerged in the U.S. called biofeedback, which is a way of re- learning to relax your body really deeply with the help of electronic gadgets, which measure things like muscle tension and uh, temperature. And so I-, I chased all over the country learning how to do this. And with a- within about six sessions, uh, the whole migraine problem virtually went away. I, I was so impressed by this that uh, I... Uh, began to use this in my medical practice with my patients. And I was just uh, absolutely fascinated about how mind and consciousness could be used in a positive way for serious medical problems, which didn't respond to anything else. So, Carolyn, from from those days, I was really hooked on the use of 
one's mind and emotions uh, uh, in uh, health and illness. And then shortly after that, the research in the United States just simply exploded looking at the role of uh, spirituality in health care. Uh, this started in the 1980s, and uh, I began to write books uh, looking at uh, the relevance of spirituality to health and healing. And this uh, latest book, One Mind, is the 12th book in, uh, that I have uh, published along these lines. And uh, uh, so you and I are really singing from the same page uh, of the hymnal here, emphasizing the role of oneness and unity and not just the way uh, our bodies work, but in terms of uh, how uh, everything works, including uh, the natural world in general. So I'm really happy to have the opportunity to discuss this issue of oneness with you. Wonderful. Um, Not only that, we have something else in common. Um, The only... I I have to say I've lived in a, I'm 53 years old I've I've lived an ex- extremely healthy life but um the one thing I did struggle with for many years was severe migraines and um they started I would say maybe about 20 years ago and it 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 started gradually where it wasn't that bad and it, they just got worse and worse where I got to the point where at least 3 days a week a month I was literally in the bed with the blind clothes under the covers, could not get out the nausea. Like you said, migraines affects your whole body. (laughs) So I know exactly what you're talking about, and they got worse and worse. And I've always been one that I never um, really would go to a pill for a solution. Um, That was just kind of innate in me. It was just um, I started meditating. I read, um, Mm -hmm. I just, and within, I I literally say within two weeks of meditation, daily meditating, 20 to 30 minutes every morning, after two weeks, I never got another migraine. And I, (laughs) and it was, so I I understand exactly what you're talking about. Um, Just calming my mind, calming my thoughts, just uh, deep breathing and, uh, the migraines were gone, and that was having my migraine headaches was the worst experience. I mean, you can't even describe it because <laughs> people think, "Oh, a headache." It's not just a headache, uh, and I know you 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 understand what I'm saying. And to be able to pretty much cure myself with meditation, I I always advocate when people tell me they have migraines try meditation <laughs> and drinking more water too i find that helps as well so there's a we we definitely have a, a lot in common in in that area um but I, actually i didn't um discover um oneness until i saw the film what the bleep that actually woke me up to uh-huh. the truth the truth of oneness um there was one line that really resonated with me and woke me up. And um, Lynn McTaggart um, said, um, the biggest problem in the world today is the illusion of separateness. And when she said that, something woke up inside of me. And it just, I'm like, I get it. And all everything I was struggling with, I was, I've been studying spirituality off and on since the 70s, I would say, um, and, and I struggled with it um, because it's so different from how we're raised. So I, I struggled with the concept uh, um, that I was studying in metaphysics until I understood oneness. And when I understood one, oneness, everything made sense to me. So, um, But I... I, I I understand exactly what you're saying and how what's so wonderful is that you are a medical doctor and you are introducing this in the western medical field of um thinking we're we're you know doctors look at us as if we're machines you know like we're you know, like the mind body spirit connection isn't there i mean it's changing it's definitely changing in your field but please share more of your journey and um, what, y- you know, you have discovered through your work. Dr. Larry, did 
Did I lose you? Dr. Larry? Uh, can you hear me? Dr. Larry, are you there? Uh, oh, I hope we haven't lost him. Um, let's see. I'll click on his mic again. All right. Uh, something is amiss. I'm not hearing Dr. Larry. I don't know if he should call in. Dr. Larry, if you're hearing me, um, I can't hear you, so maybe you should call in again. Uh, I'm not sure what, what just happened. We lost our, our guest speaker. Um, okay, here. I think here we go. Let's try this. Okay. Dr. Larry, are you there? Yeah, I don't know what happened, but here we are. I have no idea. That (laughs) technical issue there, that was crazy. Um, Okay. (laughs) I'm glad you're back. (laughs) Um, Okay. So were you able to still hear me? Well, you were, uh, when uh, I disappeared there, you were talking to me about uh, the use of meditation in migraine. Right. Okay, and then at some point you couldn't hear me anymore? That's Yeah, you just uh, vanished. I just, oh, okay, I am sorry. You, you're, the number was still there, so I assumed you were there. But that's okay. We got you back. That's all that matters. Okay, so what I, what I was asking you is could you share more of, um, you know, your your experience in the medical field, um, especially because it's so wonderful that medical doctors like yourself are now recognizing the role of mind and spirit in healthcare. So, could you share more of your your experience with us? Well, one of the things that uh, was uh, very important for me was uh, my discovery in the 1980s of a new body of research which I didn't know existed at the time. Uh, this had to do with the use of uh, intentions and prayer in uh, healing. Uh, I went all through my medical training, uh, uh, university and medical school and postgraduate training, without even knowing that this field existed. But in 1988, there was a, a famous uh, paper, a research paper published from uh, uh, California, from San Francisco, uh, in which a cardiologist did what we call a controlled uh, clinical study of patients in the coronary care unit, uh, and uh, it involved assigning prayer to half the people uh, who were patients in the coronary care unit with severe chest pain or an actual heart attack, and comparing them to a group which was not assigned prayer, uh, and simply seeing uh, how these two groups did. Uh, as it turned out, the group that was assigned prayer did better on so many counts uh, compared to the group that was not assigned prayer, so that if uh, what was being looked at here was not the effects of prayer but the effects of a new medication, say, then this would have been heralded a modern, as a modern medical breakthrough. There were many areas where the people who were assigned prayer did much better, including uh, the need for CPR, cardiac pulmonary resuscitation, none of the people who were prayed for had to have this done compared to several who experienced cardiac arrest in the unprayed for group. Well, I didn't know what to do with this study uh, because I'd never heard of anything like this. Uh, at that time in my own practice, I had patients in the coronary care unit uh, all the time. And so the question for me as a doctor was, you know, should you get on board and start praying for your patients. Uh, I wasn't really wedding, uh, willing to do this on the basis of a single study, so I spent several years looking at the, all the literature in the world I could get my hands on, exploring this question of whether people's compassionate healing intentions, sometimes called prayer, uh, had any effect on sick people. Uh, what I found, Carolyn, was just absolutely uh, revealing I found over 130 studies which have been done in this field. Uh, Two-thirds of them showed that the people who were prayed for did better than those not prayed for. And I began uh, began to let this make a difference in how I treated my patients. I adopted a prayer ritual every morning earlier than usual uh, when I went to my office and uh, asked that the best thing happen for the patients that I was going to see in the coronary care unit that day. 
and also for patients who would be coming to my office later that day. And I continued this uh, throughout my medical uh, practice career. Uh, it evolved into a series of books, which I've already mentioned, uh, one mm-hmm. of which uh, was well-received by Oprah and wound up on the New York Times uh, bestseller list, a book called Healing Words, uh, which looked at the role of prayer and uh, health and healing in medicine. And so uh, that's just sort of a short version of uh how I began to look at spirituality and medical practice and let it make a difference in uh, my interactions with my own patients. I must add, Carolyn, that since that time, there have been tremendous changes in medical education. Back when that book came out, uh, out of the 125 medical schools in the country, only three of them had any sort of coursework looking at the role of spirituality and health and healing and And now, as we speak, around 90 of uh, the nation's medical schools have come on board uh, featuring coursework, actual coursework, looking at the uh, importance of uh, uh, spirituality in uh, health and healing. So we've come a long way. These are historic changes in the way medical schools are now educating young doctors about the importance of spirituality and health. That's wonderful that that um, the medical uh, Western medicine is moving in that direction. Um, I, I spent quite a bit of time in the cardiac uh, ICU with my son. Um, he he was born with a hole in his heart, and um, he lived a very healthy 26 years. Uh, even played football in high school. So uh, when he was born. The doctors said, oh, he has a, a hole. He didn't say what size. He didn't say big, small. He didn't um, classify the size of the hole, but he had no concern about the hole <laughs> in his heart. He said, it'll close by the time he's two. Nothing to worry about. Um, so, obviously, it didn't close. Um, he was very healthy. Like I said, I was never one to always run to doctors. Um, Neither one of my children were really sick growing up. We, I did the well checkup, baby checkups, but after they got through all of the well baby checkups and vac- vaccines they need for school, um, I didn't really, if they didn't need to go to the doctors, we weren't at the doctors a lot. Um, but my son, he, um, obviously the hole did not close, and at some point um, in his early 20s or, or mid-20s, um, sorry, yeah, early to mid-20s, he must have gotten a, an infection that um, got into his heart, and he was diagnosed with congestive heart failure um, at the age of 20, 26. And, um, and he wasn't living a healthy lifestyle. He was smoking and overweight, and so none of that really helped um, his situation. But I spent, you know, um, months at a time in a cardiac ICU with you, with him, and I actually, the first time I was in cardiac ICU with him, I, I experienced, we both experienced a miracle, that doctors, uh, doctors didn't think this was in 2011. Um, the doctors did not think he was going to make it. He had pneumonia, and because his heart was so weak, they had him on life support, and they didn't think he um, was going to survive. He was going to recover from pneumonia because his heart was so weak. And um, I could tell. I just knew. I, I have no medical training, but I knew that he, his body, he did not want to be on life support. He did not want to have the vent. He was fighting the vent. They, even though he was semi-sedated, he kept trying to pull out the vent. Um, I knew that his body wanted to heal. He was young, and his body wanted to heal itself, <laughs> basically. And um, I asked the doctors, when are they going to take him off of uh, the vent? And they said, oh, it's not going to be a while. It will be a while. That night, he literally pulled himself off of um, the vent and was able to breathe fine. And they were astonished. They they couldn't, you know, they were astonished that he was breathing fine on his own. He pulled out the vent, he pulled out the feeding tube, and it was like overnight he was healed from, he still had a weak heart, but from the pneumonia, he like 
healed, his body healed himself because the doctors were all scratching their heads. So I, I've witnessed um, a miracle um, in in a cardiac ICU. Um, I did lose my son last year, um, 2014. Um, he needed he his heart had gotten to the point where he he desperately needed a heart transplant and and didn't make it he didn't get a heart transplant but um I understand what you mean by the power of prayer because um I hope I didn't lose you are you still there doctor Yes, I am here. I'm listening okay, to this uh, after, dripping. Story. After I, I lost you once before, I'm just afraid to lose you again. <laughs> so, but <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. Very good, very good. But yes, so I, I definitely understand, and I understand the power of prayer is is amazing, and um, intentions, and it doesn't matter. I, I love how when I've heard you speak, and say, it doesn't matter what prayer, it doesn't matter religion, what prayer you're praying, but that intention to heal, that healing attention has has um, power um, behind it. Well, I would want to emphasize what you just said. A lot of people uh, automatically associate prayer with a particular religion which they uh, belong to. But I happen to say of the hundreds of studies uh, that have been done, it's pretty clear that no particular religion uh, has a monopoly on the effects of prayer. And uh, there are some religions, uh, such as certain sects of Buddhism, which uh, are not uh, a theistic religion. They don't even believe in a supreme being. But the studies show that Buddhist prayer is just as effective as uh, any other kind of prayer. So I, I think that what we don't want to do is to say that, you know, any particular religion uh, is has a one-up on the effects of prayer. What seems to be so important in these studies looking at the effects of prayer is the level of uh, genuineness and authenticity and love and compassion that uh, is part of the effort of prayer and not the particular religion that somebody belongs to. I I agree 100%. Um, I believe that um, one of the things um, I felt that I I, I have respect for all religions. I don't um, personally subscribe to any one religion, um, and I have respect for everybody's belief in religion. Um, I I just don't want to see religion divide people. And and sometimes it has that effect where people think, okay, my religion or my belief is better than yours, and and so anything that is making people go think they're separate from one another, I just don't really um, like. <laughs> you know, I think you know, religion, if if anything, should all bring us together, make us closer, make us stronger, and it should it doesn't have to be. Um, one is right over the other. It's just love, really. If 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 love is at the core of your belief system, then that's what it's all about. It's just loving one another um, to bring everybody on the you know the same page. We don't have to agree, you know, to disagree. <laughs> you know, we could still love each other and not have the same belief systems. Well, I certainly agree with you there. Unfortunately, that has not been the uh, take-home message from a lot of uh, religious people. As Everybody knows the, so many of the struggles uh, that are going on, particularly in the Middle East these days, mm-hmm. are because people do have an exclusive idea of the correctness of their own uh, belief system. And uh, if we persist in that, we're just going to continue to tear the world apart. And uh, there's every reason... Uh, under the world for us to really take this philosophy of oneness and unity and connectedness uh, very seriously. Because if we don't, I don't think we're going to be able to meet the challenges that confront us as human beings with all the problems that we're looking at, including global warming, uh, the collapse of species, and uh, the problems with fisheries and the acidification of the oceans and so on. So many of these problems come from people who have fallen into a system of greed and selfishness, who want nothing more than a profit from uh, manipulating uh, the natural environment. And we're going to continue to wreck the planet unless we can find a way to come together uh, and respect not just one another, but all of sentient life on the planet as well. Mm -hmm. Very true. 
Very true. And it's it's so true what you said because oneness um, isn't a religion. I keep having, having to say that to people. It's not about a religion. Oneness is about unity and us working together as a, um, a species, but not, like you say, we're all connected to all of the life on the planet, and we're connected to the planet as a whole because the earth is also a living organism, and everything is interconnected. And once we understand that, um, really at, a, uh, at our core, a, as a society, then it's going to solve, it'll solve just that unity concept, that oneness concept will solve all of the problems that we are facing, um, as I, I believe. This is my belief. And I always have to say that um, when I'm, I'm sharing my belief that I'm just sharing my belief. I'm not trying to... Um, make anyone believe as I believe, but I believe that it just, it, it seems so obvious to me, and um, it doesn't have to be complicated, <laughs> so that's the, that's the message, that, that's why I started the radio show, and, um, and just to help, help um, spread the message of oneness, and hopefully have it touch someone where they can um, share that love. Share Living in oneness is now the next step. Because I believe just from being online, there are a lot of people, I uh, can't put a number on it, but hundreds of thousands of people who believe in oneness. Now it is time for those people that believe in that just to live in that truth of oneness and, and share it with others, I believe. Um, so we well, you know, I would... Yeah, go right ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, I uh, I would even up the uh, figure that you just uh, mentioned. I I've looked at, uh, for example, the number of people who have had uh, near death experiences, and currently the surveys show that uh, upwards of 15 million Americans say they have had a near death experience. And I bring this up because it has a lot to do with oneness. The key message that people bring back from having uh, had a near-death experience is uh, the message of oneness and unity. They come back saying that they had this marvelous transformative experience in which they felt that there was no separation between themselves and uh, events and people. uh, And they say that they felt at one with everything. And this is not just a poetic, metaphorical statement. These people's lives are absolutely transformed when they come back and uh, and reconnect with uh, life in the everyday world. And they live out of a feeling of empathy and compassion and concern with other people. So when we talk about this business, the one is I want people to understand that we're just not talking, you know, in a very sentimental or poetic way. This has transformative power over people's lives who have experienced it. And I, I want to emphasize also that you don't have to have a near-death experience to get into this state of oneness. Uh, there are many, many ways where people can appreciate this and actually have this experience themselves. So uh, it's freely available. It uh, uh, can be approached by so many ways. One thing that I've enjoyed because of my own career and my involvement with science is because of the, the many ways that scientists are now talking about and intrinsic oneness in, in the world. You had Dean Radin, Dr. Dean Radin, a researcher yeah. on uh, recently, who talked about entanglement and non-locality. And people may think, well, I don't want to have anything to do with those crazy words because I don't understand that, and that's hardcore science. But it's so simple. Uh, right. Everything's connected to everything else. The poets and the, the scientists are agreed on this point if they're willing to look at the evidence. Uh, so it's not hard to appreciate this sort of uh, experience that you and I are talking about. This is so true. Um, I have not had that experience through meditation. I, I basically um, meditate now when I'm at the lake because um, I'm just I love sitting by the water. Um, so I don't meditate daily like I used to. But um, I know many people have have come to, had that experience of oneness through meditation, and um, Dean Radin had mentioned last week on the show 
um, the astronaut, I can't remember his name, but the astronaut that um, when he was coming back to Earth and was looking at the, the world. Um, that was Edgar Mitchell, he, by the way. Okay. The experience he had, which was basically what you just described, that um, mystic experience of oneness, and he wanted to understand it more scientifically. So um, I said to, to Dean last week, I'd love to write a book, um, uh, Spirituality for Dummies, in the sense that it doesn't have to be complicated. I know the science, like you're, you're, in, you're a doctor, Dean's a scientist, and um, quantum physics can get very complicated, but it doesn't have the a uh, whole concept and idea of oneness doesn't have to be complicated. So, um I agree so much with what you said. Can you can you share with us more about um the book that you wrote One Mind? Now, is One Mind your latest book? Yes, it is uh, my latest book. It's been out uh, a couple of years and uh, it goes into this idea that uh our minds are linked together. There aren't any boundaries. Uh, you can't separate, uh, at some level, you can't separate one consciousness from another. Uh, so the entire book uh, looks at the ways in which we are connected and the reasons why uh, we would even say something like this. Uh, actually, in in my business, my end of things, uh, medicine and the associated fields of psychology and psychiatry, people have had a hard time with this. Uh, one of the reasons is that in medical school and even in university, if if kids have any exposure to biology and the hard sciences, they're they're just brainwashed with this idea that consciousness is produced by the brain, and uh, uh, so your mind is confined to your cranium and your your body, and uh, it can't possibly op- operate beyond the confines of your body. Uh, the problem with that is that the evidence shows that that isn't right. Uh, if you go looking at experiments uh, that show that people can exchange thoughts and complex uh, mental uh, images and uh, from from one side of the planet to another in a field called remote viewing, you find that people can share complex thoughts and uh, images and, and, and so on, no matter how far apart they are. There, there are just thousands of experiments looking at telepathy and clairvoyance and remote viewing and so on, which shows that this, this is just the way the world works. So, mm-hmm. what the the image of consciousness that's coming out of all this research is that you can't put one mind in a box and separate it from all the other minds out there. And so, we're coming to realize that at some dimension, minds do come together. And that's why we call this the universal mind or the one mind, because this is just the way things are. I uh, I, I want to add that you know spirituality is a direct uh, a direct result from these images because we now know that uh, that idea of oneness and unity is the most basic mystical message that the great spiritual traditions have to share with people. The feeling that you're one with everything. Well, this picture comes out of all the experiments that have been done. So this is a way that spirituality and science actually come together. And I know that uh, Dr. Dean Radin and others who have been on your program share their uh, experiments and and, uh, their findings which confirm this. So I I just want people to know that you can come at this from... Uh, your own direct experience. You don't have to go through science or laboratory studies or anything like that, but we all wind up at the same point, which is uh, a system of unity and connectedness and profound uh, oneness, uh, which is just the way the world happens to work, and it's about time we realize this. Right. Very true. And not only um, one mind, but also I'm thinking of um, heart math in um, mm-hmm. Howard Martin was also one of our our guests, and how he talks about how the heart, how the um, electromagnetic field of the heart, how it just it it radiates out from your heart. So it's when I think of one mind, I also think of one heart. You know, it's sure. it's like truly we are truly connected. And I don't know for me, it's 
I want, after I saw the film What the Bleep um, in 2007, and my, my eyes were truly open to oneness and how I saw um, spirituality and science of both telling us that we're literally all one, we're all connected. Um, and you don't have to make it more complicated than that, you know. It's like, we're okay, so if I go out and hurt another person, I'm literally hurting myself. You know, if I do something kind and loving for, to another person, I, I'm, I'm, I'm loving myself. Um, and um, for Christians, Jesus said, uh, you treat your neighbor as yourself. And I believe Jesus said that because he knew your neighbor was yourself, you know. So, it I don't know. Um, I believe we, I do, I believe, and I, I say this a lot, I, I liken the whole concept of oneness as um, like when mankind at one time thought the world was flat hundreds of years ago. Uh, if you had said, um, no, I think it might be round, they, the society at that time would think you were crazy. Um, mm-hmm. And I believe that uh, mankind is evolving to come to, is coming to know that we are literally all one. And it's going to be a fact <laughs> in, man, in, in society like uh, the world is round. Now we all know, yeah, the world is round. We're not going to argue that point anymore. And I think mankind will evolve. I believe mankind will evolve to that point. I don't know when, but to that point where he knows we're all literally connected. And he knows it as a fact. So, and, and life would be, will be very different on, that, on this planet when that day um, arrives. And I think we are heading in that direction. I love what well, I uh, you meant. Oh, I'm, go, ahead, go ahead. Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think we better get uh, with it because I don't think that time is on our side. I think that uh, there is a huge urgency to our realization of that, that we are connected and there's uh, going to be... T- increasing tragedy unless we can come into that realization uh and so for me the question is how how do people get there uh i don't think we have another thousand years to you know fool around and just sort of keep our fingers crossed and hope that everybody eventually comes around to this way of thinking uh you mentioned one way that uh uh, people uh, have uh, had this realization uh Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut, had a life-changing experience, as you mentioned earlier. I mentioned this in my book, The One Mind, and and looking at ways that people can come into the awareness. He just stumbled on this, coming back from the moon to the earth, looking at the distant uh, earth, this big, blue, beautiful marble in outer space, and saw that he could not see any boundaries at all. Uh, Mm -hmm. You don't see territorial lines or lines separating countries from outer space. You just see one entity. And uh, I've often wished that we could send every human being out into space and let them come back and <laughs> and have this experience. But unfortunately, that's not possible. So another right. question is, you know, what do we do here on Earth? Uh, well, I'll mention... Thing... Okay, mm-hmm. go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to go say ahead. that one thing that has been really important in my wife's and my life uh, for the past 30, 35 years and helping this realization of oneness become real to us is exposure to nature. You you, meant, you mentioned meditating by the lake. You know, this is part of what I have in mind. My wife and I, at, at, great, uh, uh, at great effort, have managed to take August off every year. We've arranged our affairs and and so on to make this possible. And so Every August, we go up into wilderness somewhere in the Rocky Mountains uh, and just camp out alone in isolation at 12,000 feet among majestic uh, mountain alpine lakes and and mountains and so on, uh, just for the purpose of rebalancing and coming into contact with this mystical state of oneness uh, with uh, nature. And I just can't imagine anything... uh, more helpful that can put you in that place than periodic exposure to nature. Uh, everybody can't go off into the wilderness uh, like that, but you can at least do something like you mentioned. Arrange right. your affairs so that you can 
you know, spend time uh, at a resort or at camp if you're a kid or uh, uh, just taking a walk in a park or uh, uh, something like that so that you can be quiet and pay attention and let nature do its do on you and send you those messages of unity and connectedness. So we can make this as complicated as we want, but one of the ways of getting there to this realization is exposure to great beauty, among which is exposure to nature. It doesn't have to be nature. People have the same experience sometimes listening to majestic music or mm-hmm. taking a walk through an art museum and looking at beautiful art. But there, So there are many ways to experience this, uh, this sense that you and I are talking about. That is so true. That is so true. I, I am fortunate. I, I live in the Poconos in northeastern PA, and I am just a few miles from a beautiful lake. And I take, if it's a beautiful day, I don't care how much work I have to do. If it's a beautiful day, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate I'm self-employed. So I can just uh-huh. go out to the lake and watch the sunset. I on, When it's nice, I try to go to the lake and watch the sunset three times a week. So I'm, I'm fortunate, and that's what resonates with me. But like you said, it, it's whatever, like music or the arts or what resonates with your heart, what really brings you a sense of peace and calm. Right. That's, that's what you need to do more of to get in that state, uh, to feel that state of oneness. Um, I was just going to interject about um, what Humanities Team is doing with the Global Oneness Day, uh-huh. which is October 24th, coming up uh-huh. soon. Um, and it will, this will be the sixth annual Global Oneness Day, and it is a, a free uh, webinar or a free um, tele-summit event that anyone could sign up for. It's a 13-hour um, talk that um, there will be many, um, several great speakers like Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Michael Bernard Beckwith, Marianne Williamson, uh, Neil Donald Walsh, just to name a few, uh, Panash Desai. I mean, all these speakers are going to be speaking. There will be speakers from Spirituality. Dean Radin is going to also be one of the speakers. Um, I'm just looking at the page right now. Um, There's going to be many speakers from science as well as spirituality speaking about what we're talking about right now, which is unity and oneness. And that uh, anyone can go to the website, which is globaloneness.org, and register for free to listen to 13 hours. Uh, it will be um, West Coast time. It is 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. West Coast time. So um, uh, wait to Oneness Radio and the Kyle Foundation, which is a foundation I am um, starting, nonprofit foundation I'm starting in my son's memory, we will be hosting a celebration on that day. Um, this year, thankfully, it's on a Saturday. So Saturday, October 24th, if you're in northeast Pennsylvania, we will be celebrating at Pocono Mountain Public Library in Toby Hanna from 10 to 2. And if anybody's interested, they can always go um, for more details. You can go to wake to oneness radio, uh, dot org, or also, um, again, to register for the, the summit, go to Global Oneness Summit dot org. I just wanted to interject because you were asking how can we bring this about sooner, and I I honestly believe that the momentum of oneness and unity is moving faster and faster and faster every day. So I, I understand what you mean about time. Yeah, we the the time is now. The time is definitely now to to head in that direction of oneness and unity um, for all of our sake. Oh, I believe that that's true, and uh, I I think you're right. There is a momentum that is unmistakable, uh, and uh, I'm happy to hear about the the event which you just uh, mentioned, and I would really encourage people to be a part of that because those are world-class speakers that you mentioned and uh you can just sort of get a jump 
start on your journey if you if you care to put it that way uh, by right. exposure to people who are already there and who have this mm-hmm. uh, this uh, vision. You know, you mentioned a moment ago the golden rule: do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I I think that this this thing of oneness is so profound that we are justified in what I want to call upgrading the golden rule to an even uh, more uh, uh, a more explicit form. I would say that we ought to change the golden rule to something like this. Uh, be kind and compassionate to others because, in some sense, they are you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've always yeah. thought that the golden rule was a little selfish. Do unto others because you want to get something nice back. And right. I think we're beyond mm-hmm. that. You know, we mm-hmm. one is compels us to take an even more uh, dramatic approach to the golden rule. And uh, one of my favorite Very novelists good. is Alice Walker, who has uh, said that anything we love can be saved. And I think that that's uh, what we're talking about here with respect to the environment and uh, the earth itself. The question becomes, do we love the earth enough? Do we feel at one uh, with it to the degree that we're willing to change our behaviors and uh, think in terms of oneness and the effect of what we do, uh, just not in terms of what we can get in return, but in terms of what we can uh, do to to stabilize the environment and make a change about our future. And if we don't, then there's going to be hell to pay in terms of future generations uh, which uh, an increasing number of people are very sensitive to. Very true. Very true. So, um, yeah, I, I believe the, the next step, because I do believe there are uh, many people um, from all walks of life, from all religion, that understand oneness and unity. Um, I, I think um, what it is, though, I think I've heard you mention, like, in your earlier days, um, when you were first um, um, a young doctor, <laughs> you were almost afraid to to mention to your colleagues about your interests. So some of it, it's like um, I've heard someone say that oneness is in the closet. You know, there are people that believe in oneness, but since it's not quote unquote popular, you know, right. they're in the closet. So I think it's time for people that truly have an understanding of oneness to come out of the closet also. Um, because I know a lot of times people feel fear that if they're not sociably accepted, you know, the, their message. I have to be honest. Um, I've lost friends when I, I started this radio show. Um, most of my friends were fundamental Christians, and um, I wasn't um, ex- Expressing what they quote uh, felt was quote unquote a Christian message, I lost friends. Um, one of my very closest friends stopped speaking to me. So it it it, it to step out um, in your belief and it's something that's not popular can be scary. But I I believe if you follow your heart, um, it's going to always lead you someplace good. Um, you may not know where it's going to lead you, but it's going to lead you someplace good. And I know um, um, Reverend Michael Bernard Beckwith has said to me that um, maybe um, I'll meet, you know, I'll meet on my journey, new journey, my new path. I'll meet new friends and new people to that are that are supposed to help me along with this journey, and not worry about the friends that I don't have anymore. I still love them. I mean, there's nobody, I I love everybody, I truly do when I say that. I have no animosity towards anyone, but I kind of do understand what people mean when they say um, oneness is in the closet. I think there are more people that believe in oneness that are not expressing that um, for fear of not being popular. What do you think of that thought right there? Well, I think uh, you're exactly right. Uh, When I was uh, in my early days in practice of internal medicine, uh, it's exactly right. There was a real price to pay for uh, going public about uh, these ideas of oneness and unity and the idea that your consciousness could could act outside of your brain and body and even outside the present moment. 
uh, people looked at you like you'd lost your mind uh, back in the 1960s and 70s if you talk like that. Uh, I'm happy to be able to say that that is really changing fast in my profession. Uh, just as an example, uh, uh, about three or four years ago, I gave a, a lecture to a group of uh, internal medicine doctors who were gathered together from for a continuing medical education update conference sponsored by Harvard Medical School. And so uh, they wanted me to talk about these ideas, which you and I are discussing. And so I did. But at the end of the lecture, I thought, they're just not getting it. You know, they'll never ask me back here, you know. Uh, but I had told them my own experiences with precognitive dreams and uh, how my own consciousness seemed to operate sometimes outside my brain and body. And uh, in the Q&A session, I thought they would probably all get up and leave, but nobody budged. And then, Carol, something really interesting happened. They began to share their own experiences with me. I'd already made a fool out of myself, so they knew I wasn't going to criticize them. And so they began to tell stories that they said most of them would uh, say they had never told anybody in their life. One female internist stood up in this group of hundreds of doctors and said, uh, well, I get numbers in my dreams. She said, I, I dream the num I dream the specific laboratory values of my patient's lab tests before I even order the tests. Mm -hmm. And it went from there. And so I, it was a very invigorating, inspiring moment for me because uh, here were some of the smartest doctors anywhere willing to go public with events mm -hmm. which they just could not talk about 20 years ago, say. Because if they did, they might even lose their hospital privileges or wouldn't get grants for research or something like this. But right. that has changed dramatically. And now most of the medical schools in the United States, as I mentioned earlier, have actual courses mm -hmm. that support this sort of uh, evidence and these sorts of experiences. So we're getting there. <laughs> yes. People are coming out <laughs> of the closet. Yes. Yes. And I, I, um, I think that's kind of... One of, one of the things that I think will help, like what you said about maybe if nature is your thing or music or the arts, whatever is your thing that you, if you already have, because what I'm trying to do is preach to the choir. People that mm -hmm. already understand oneness, um, if now let's, let's act on that. As, you know, let's act on it globally. So I think the more people that already understand the truth of oneness um, actually start living in oneness and and um, coming out and speaking to others about oneness. Just, you know, whatever, however they feel comfortable doing it. I think um, we'll get there even faster. Like you said, it, the time is now. Um, we don't have another thousand years <laughs> to wait for, for oneness to, to become a reality. And... Um, I believe that we are heading in that direction. I truly do. Uh, and it's amazing when I meet people like you. Even though know, we haven't met face to face, but <laughs> I love knowing that doctors in the medical field are are awaking to this truth um, of oneness. Because in, in the medical profession, I think it's truly needed. Um, I com I'm I'm myself completely holistic. And it's, like I said, I am a natural holistic where I became holistic before I knew to be holistic. It just mm -hmm. was, it just was something innate in me. So, um, if anything else me, I'm taking something natural. <laughs> That's sure. just me. Um, but Western medicine has its, um, good points. I mean, emergency medicine, um, if you have a broken arm, if you're in an accident, you need Western medicine, um, so it, it definitely is needed. It's just um, now looking at the body not just as a robot, as a machine, and the Newtonian um, classical physical model. Um, well, the secret and the challenge is uh, not to do away with high-tech modern medicine, but to learn how to use... Uh, medications and surgical procedures and, and and so on in a very wise, constructive mm -hmm. way and to supplement it 
with uh, additional factors which also have a huge import importance, such as the role of spirituality and consciousness that you and I have been talking about. So we don't want to paint ourselves into a corner and say, I'm just going right. to use drug, surgical procedure, and high-tech medicine uh, al- alone. The complementarity, the integration of all of these things is where we're, uh, I, I think, headed, and that's going to be the medicine of the future. Yes, I agree. I agree. It's um, um, the two can merge, I believe. Um, mm-hmm. More holistic and modern day medicine can can come to a meeting of the minds <laughs> of that <Right>. one mind. <laughs> right. Yes. So this has been so wonderful. I can't believe every time I I, I have a wonderful guests on like yourself, um, the time just flies. But can you share, um, would you like to share any um, upcoming events or um, talks that you might be um, having with the audience? Well, I uh, have a website which uh, has my schedule and itinerary on it. And mm-hmm. my website is uh, com, And the spelling on Dossie is D-O-S-S-E-Y, LarryDossieMD.com. So people can catch up uh, and keep up with my comings and goings via the website and also the uh, uh, order information for the book, uh, One Mind, is available on the website as well. It's yes. really been great talking with you. It's, it's been amazing. I, I just I am so thankful and so grateful that I am, because I'm trying to do what the show um, is, uh, show the scientific view and the the spiritual view um, in an equal um, format. And I am so thankful for scientists and doctors and all the um, spiritual speakers that have been on because it just is just trying to share the message, really, of oneness in, in a way that you understand that it's not... Um, it's not a religion. It's not a dogma. It's just, um, to me, that when you can really look at the evidence, scientifically and spiritually, that we are literally all one and connected. And when you understand that, and um, I believe it will change your world. It'll, it'll be. It'll change how you interact with others in this world. And and when we do that one person at a time, that's how we get to where we want to be. <laughs> Can I so, close with a little short poem? Of course, please. Well, this is uh, from Hafiz, a Persian poet from way back in the 14th century, who even then was talking about oneness. And uh, here's what he wrote. Let's go deeper, go deeper. For if we do, our spirits will embrace and interweave. Our union will be so glorious that even God will not be able to tell us apart. Mm -hmm. That is beautiful. That is so beautiful. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Larry. And I am hoping one day I do actually get to meet all my guests in person. Um, I'm hoping to be able to travel the country and just meet all these wonderful um, speakers that um, are sharing the same message in their own way. And thank you so much for taking your time out, your busy schedule, to be with us this evening. And I will say good night, and you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Carolyn. Many blessings to you. Many blessings to you. Thank you so much.